lies and fear, the Democrat Party's go-to political tools. That's the topic of today's Bold and Blunt, and I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. And just look around at the last two-plus years under the coronavirus, and what do you see? What do you see when you look at the landscape? I see lies and fear. I see the lies of the left being told to justify the continued clampdowns on individual liberties, and these lies buoyed, spurred, driven forth by fear, by exploiting the fear of good, hardworking American citizens. It's disgusting, it's despicable, and to steal from Hillary Clinton, it's deplorable. Before I get into all that, I want to remind you and regular listeners of Bold and Blunt already know this, but maybe you've forgotten. Where can you get Bold and Blunt? I know it is the question that keeps you up at night, so let me answer it for you. You can go to WashingtonTimes.com, scroll to the bottom of the page in the newsletter section, click on it, find my name, that is Cheryl Chumley, click on that, and subscribe to my three times a week newsletter, which contain all my commentaries that I write all week long at the Washington Times times, as well as my twice-weekly Bold and Blunt podcast. You can also get Bold and Blunt at edify.app backslash podcast. That is the online platform for faith-based podcasts. And, of course, you can also get Bold and Blunt anywhere podcasts are offered. So, sleep well tonight, my esteemed Bold and Blunt listeners, because now you know. Now you have your question answered how to subscribe to Bold and Blunt. And here's an episode you do not want to miss. Fears and lies. My, how the Democrats play up these two things in order to advance their personal, political, private agendas, regardless of what the Constitution says, regardless of what even good, solid moral compasses say, the Democrats use fear and lies to advance their agenda, however, and in and as frequently, in as many instances as they possibly can. Look at all the lies that the left pushed forth over the last two years of COVID. You had the lies of the medical bureaucrats, right? You had the lies of the medical bureaucrats who were predicting way, way back when, exactly, precisely, in their best guess scenario, in their most scholarly educated guesses and estimates, how many people could die from the coronavirus. Keyword, keyword could. Of course you can't predict how many will die. So what these medical bureaucrats did was they used computer modeling, the same type of computer modeling that climate change alarmists use, no less, but they used computer modeling to guess at what could be the worst case scenario in America, around the world, if citizens did not do government order number one or government mandate number two or government dictate number three. If we didn't do all that the government told us to do, if we didn't do all that the medical bureaucrats working in government told us to do, this many people, X amount, Y amount, Z amount, and ever-changing amount could potential, potentially would, perhaps might die. And those qualifiers were conveniently brushed over or pushed aside or outright ignored when the media entered the picture. Lie number two, the media. The media was the biggest. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know which is the biggest liar of the last two years of the coronavirus clampdown. So Let's just stay away from guessing which was the biggest. One of the most frequent liars, one of the loudest liars, how about that? The media. All you had to do for almost the first full year of the coronavirus, and then even even some weeks thereafter, but all you had to do was click on any television news network, cable or otherwise, and you could see in the bottom right-hand corner that ever-present, ever-changing, ever-escalating, ever-frightening, real-time case count positives of the coronavirus. As if, as if it meant anything. 
I mean, think about this. Did we do this for the flu? Did we do this every time flu season rolled around and put in the bottom right-hand corner of news networks how many people in that particular day, in that particular moment in time, tested positive for the flu? Do we do that for how many children died from the flu each year, even though more children died from the flu than from the coronavirus? Do we do that? No, we didn't. You know why? Because it's stupid. It's meaningless. Case counts, positive case counts mean nothing. Just because you test positive for something, it doesn't mean you even feel sick, right? A lot of people who test positive for the coronavirus, even today, even today, don't have any symptoms, don't feel sick. So for two years, American citizens lined up to take tests to see if they were sick, even though they didn't feel sick. And then once they tested positive, they took all those cautionary measures that the government advised them to take in order to stave off their sickness, even though they never felt sick. Is that ludicrous? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And they did it because they were told that it doesn't just protect you, but you have to protect everybody else. So it's not about you and your individual rights and your individual right to self-determine your own health treatments. It's about you taking care of the world at large. If you don't get a test for COVID and find out whether you are a carrier, then you're not doing your proper responsible duty for all the other citizens of the world that you may come into contact with that day. You're putting them at risk. You're putting other people in danger. You're killing other people. See the shift from individualism to collectivism. See how sneaky and sly the left is about changing the mindset of American citizens Americans born into a country with a DNA where rights come from God, not government. American citizens bred on the idea that rugged independence and individual choice is the way to go. See how that shifted under two years of the coronavirus? It's not about you. It's about everybody else. Everybody put a face mask on. Let's be like in China where they wear face masks. All day long, wear face masks whenever anybody sneezes, whenever anybody coughs, whenever any media report talks about a new virus emerging, whenever the government orders them to wear face masks, they wear face masks. And by God, the left thinks that's how it should be here in America. And so that's what we saw under the last two years of the coronavirus. People doing for others, even though they knew in many instances that it was silly, that it was non-scientific, that it was the opposite of factual, that it was an outright lie. People did it anyhow. Too many people did it anyhow. The lies of the medical providers, not just the medical bureaucrats, but the medical providers, the hospitals, the clinics, the staff at your local hospitals, about whether somebody who was admitted into the hospital was admitted for the coronavirus or with the coronavirus or whether somebody died in a hospital from the coronavirus or with the coronavirus. Big, big difference. Big difference. And yet far too many hospitals and providers of medical treatments lied. Why? Because Congress gave out funding to hospitals, COVID-19 funding, based on the number of COVID patients that they served. And depending on how much treatment was needed for a COVID patient, even more funding was made available. In other words, hospitals, your local friendly hospital and your local friendly doctors and nurses at these local friendly hospitals were suddenly overnight incentivized to report as many COVID cases as they could find because that's how they were funded. And you can't entirely blame the doctors and nurses and administrators at your local friendly hospitals for doing this because at the same time, governors in states around the nation, pretty much every governor 
at certain points in time over the last couple of years issued executive orders telling local hospitals that they should clear the rooms, clear the bed space for COVID patients and put off admitting patients who were coming in for elective surgeries or operations that could be put off. So if you had, say, a knee surgery planned during especially the first year of the coronavirus, right, during 2020 to 2021, perhaps your provider told you that you had to put off doing, you had to reschedule doing that surgery because the hospital, the clinic, the medical provider had to keep rooms available for this supposedly warned about, predicted inflow of COVID tied patients. They had to save the room for all these fatalities and, and sickly due to the coronavirus that were predicted, remember, based on computer modeling and worst case, best guesses. Of course, that never panned, so big lie, right? Big lie, big lie. Then there was the whole face mask lie. Remember Surgeon General Jerome Adams making a face mask out of a t-shirt on video and telling us to slap that, uh, that on our face? Put on a bandana, wrap an old t-shirt around your face. How to make a face mask out of an old t-shirt. Remember the ridiculous face masks that I know Hollywood was putting these out, but other fashion type people were putting these forward as actual face masks, crocheted face masks, crocheted, you know, with holes in it, the, the knit stitch that has holes all in it. And you're supposed to put that on your face. And then the whole lie of face masks work, face masks work. And so people around the nation would just stuff their face masks in their pockets and, and slide them into their pocketbooks and stick them in their glove boxes of their car until they had, they had to put them on to go into a store or into a theater or into a restaurant and then pretend as if those face masks weren't dirty already. But what got me the most was putting the face mask on at the entrance of a restaurant and then being escorted 10 feet into the restaurant seated at a table where you were then allowed to take the face mask off. Now your waitress or waiter had to keep their face masks on, but you, because you were eating, you could take your face mask off. So it made me wonder, how dangerous could this virus be? I mean, if the virus is smart enough to attack those in a restaurant who are walking around and serving food so as to require those people walking and serving food to wear face masks, but is too stupid to go lower, to go down maybe one or two feet lower and attack those people seated at tables who have no face masks on, I thought this virus has to be pretty stupid, surely we can beat this virus. Surely we can eradicate this virus or is it eliminate? See, that brings up another lie. The idea of getting rid of the coronavirus. We were treated to such words uh, as let's eradicate this virus. Let's eliminate this coronavirus. We're going to destroy this coronavirus. We're going to vanquish this coronavirus. Well, here's the truth on that. First, there are more viruses on planet Earth than there are stars in the sky. Look it up. That's the truth. The media didn't report that. The media still won't report that. Why? Because the media depends on having lots of eyeballs on their screen or lots of eyeballs on the print. And it's boring to make the coronavirus seem less frightening than it is. And if you put the coronavirus in context of being just one of a bazillion other viruses in the world, that sounds a lot less alarming than making the coronavirus this brand new thing 
the world has never before seen. But the truth is, there are billions upon billions of viruses, right? We deal with them all day long. And second off, here's the other truth, you can't get rid of them. In all of human history, there have been only two viruses that have been eradicated. And by eradicated, that is an actual term. That is an actual term used in the medical community by, say, the World Health Organization or by medical bureaucrats everywhere. Eradicated is when there are zero incidences of infection, right? Eradicated is when you don't need to take intervening measures to put a stop to its spread. Other words like eliminated have an entirely different meaning in the medical world. Eliminated means they've been stopped from spreading in certain geographical areas, but they still spread in other areas. So there are definite terms and meanings that go along with viruses and diseases from the medical standpoint. Erad eradication is a very specific word. And so when you say eradication, you're talking about completely abolishing something like a virus from the face of the earth. And there have been only two instances where viruses have been eradicated. The smallpox and a virus called rinderpest, which is cattle plague. And in both instances, there are specific reasons why those were eradicated versus all the other viruses. Smallpox could only survive in humans, human hosts. It couldn't jump to animal, to animal, to animal, right? The coronavirus, they've already found it in animals, bats, deer. So you don't have that same apples to apples comparison. Rinderpest, on the other hand, was called cattle plague because it only existed in cattle. And the problem that it caused for humans was that it was so deadly in cattle. It caused famine in parts where it was seen. But all the other viruses in the world, there's great debate. There's great debate and division whether any of them can ever be eradicated any of the ones that are harmful to Americans and other citizens in other countries, whether any of those can actually be eradicated. The World Health Organization is trying to eradicate this set of viruses and diseases. And then you have the CDC in America trying to eradicate another set. And they disagree with the World Health Organization about the World Health Organization's list. So the, there's division and discussion and discord among medical bureaucrats and experts about which viruses can in fact be eradicated. But this gets back to the lie part. Eradicated versus eliminated, two very distinct different words that hold distinct different meanings in the medical community. Words that mean nothing, vanquished, abolished, wiped out. That means nothing. That's just something that politicians say because it sounds good on the bullet points, but it doesn't do anything in terms of furthering truths about the coronavirus. In fact, it does the opposite. It fuels fears. It fuels fears because people get the idea that this is a virus that if they don't bring to zero incident, zero case counts, zero test positives, that the world is going to fall in and we're all going to die. That's not the case. So there are more lies that go with this coronavirus, but honestly, I probably need another two or three shows to go through them all. What I do want to bring out today is that the big lies about the coronavirus aren't being told by the left, by the globalists, by the collectivists, just for the sake of furthering coronavirus clampdowns. No, there's a segue that's coming in. This is a piggyback moment. This is a platform spring into something bigger. And I write about this in my new book, Lockdown, The Socialist Plan to Take Away Your Freedom, out May 3rd, May 3rd, 
And let me just read you a little bit from this book, which will segue nicely into my guest today. Bill Gates wants to do with climate change what he did with the coronavirus. He wants to move on from coronavirus clampdowns to climate change clampdowns. And that's not me just writing that, right? Where do I get this? Well, let me read on. It's his post-coronavirus pet project. It's in his 2021 book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, The Solution We Have and the Breakthroughs We Need. Pendum, or Penguin Random House, published February 2021. It's the Bill Gates playbook for fans and followers to put into effect all the crazy, nonsensical, nonsensical redistribution of wealth, redistribution of resources, growth stifling, anti-American policies the mad green scientists have been shoving down Americans' throats for years. So when you're talking about sifting through the myths versus truths of the coronavirus, the larger picture here, the larger worry here, the larger warning here is to also understand the truths versus myths of climate change. And that leads to my guest today, who has a very good handle on some of the lies being pushed forth commonly, frequently, and nauseatingly, loudly from the climate change alarmist crowd. His name is David Legates. He is a research fellow at the Independent Institute and co-author of Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate. David, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. I really appreciate your time. No problem. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about your findings in your book, Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate. And I find the title interesting in itself because we have been told for years and years that climate change is settled science, and yet your book's title suggests otherwise. That's right. And in fact, uh, the book was written originally, the first and second edition were written in 1997 and 1999 by Fred Singer. And Fred always wanted to uh, finish up uh, with a third edition before he died, and he was fortunate enough to be able to do that, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be considered a co-author to help him out. Um, the, the interesting thing about the book and why it has that title is that essentially Fred was a preeminent scientist. Uh, I won't go into all of his details, but he uh, was one of the first people to develop weather satellites. So he was a scientist extraordinaire, but at the same time, he spent a lot of time in the federal government. And so he also uh, was dealing with policy issues as well. So the title Hot Talk is related to the policy issues that often becomes a heated debate. And cold science is the idea that science is not settled, but nevertheless, the science is not indicating that the world is just about ready to come to a screeching halt due to climate change. Wasn't Fred Singer the scientist that the left embraced until he started casting shadows on the narrative from the left about climate change? Uh, there have been a number of those kind of people. I mean, you know, Fred was uh, Fred was liked by a lot of people, but unfortunately, the climate change debate tends to polarize people and make enemies of people that were once good friends with each other, and I can attest to that. Okay, so let, let's talk about your findings, uh, and before we get into that, uh, I want to talk about the, the biggest uh, lies that the left tells about climate change. But before we get into that, I want to ask you, how should those in America that that understand that there are things such as pollution and they want to do their right, uh, that they, they want to do their responsible citizenship by addressing pollution in their own homes and, and recycling and so forth. How should those people look at all the narrative that comes out about climate change today? See, I also work with the Cornwall Alliance, which is an organization for biblical stewardship uh, of the environment and also trying to keep track of, of things that are true and things that aren't. And one of the things we want to not note is that there are certainly considerations regarding pollution. There are considerations regarding uh, 
helping people and so forth, and that's that should be our primary goal. But the concern has been, too, that we hold, have to hold to what is true. And in particular, in the climate change debate, a lot of what we're told just simply isn't true when you actually look at the data. And so that becomes a fundamental problem in that we've sort of created a a, um, a monster, if you will, that we're, we're trying to fight or that we want to fight. But in fact, that's not the monster. There are other issues uh, that really need to be addressed. And unfortunately, the climate change discussion takes away from some of those more important issues. Especially when you have loons on the left that seem to bow down to a green god more than an actual biblical god. And what was the name of that organization? You, what did you say it was? Cornwallis? Cornwall Alliance. Uh, you can find it at uh, cornwallalliance.org, C-O-R-N-W-A-L-L. A-L-L-I-A-N-C-E dot O-R-G. Okay, that sounds like an excellent group, and I'm going to check into it. But it, it's interesting to me uh, that you brought that up, the biblical-based view of environmentalism. How should Christians look at environmentalism uh, from the proper role that they're taught in, in the Bible, I guess? Well, if you remember in Matthew 22, I mean, the... the uh, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus what was the most important um, uh, commandment, and he simply said all of the law and the prophets can be wrapped up in the two great commandments. One is to love your God uh, with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the second is likened to it is love your neighbor as yourself. And so I think biblical stewardship comes from first putting God in the correct perspective, uh, but at the same time, also realizing that what we really want to do is love our neighbors as well. And there's a lot of people, particularly in Africa, particularly in other countries, that are um, struggling to make ends meet. And in particular, uh, energy would go a long way to helping them. And part of the problem is if we keep that energy in the ground, by as many people have talked about with fossil fuels, and it's almost uh, like the parable of the talents, keep, the, keep it in the ground, don't use it, present it back to God at the end, I'm afraid we'll get the same result we would have gotten with the, um, excuse me, the third um, uh, slave who essentially hid his talent in the ground, did nothing with it, and presented it back at the end, and was called worthless, uh, lazy slave. So we don't want to be that worthless, lazy person. What we really want to do is take care of our environment, but we want to use the resources we have wisely to take care of other people and bring them up in the world. Democrats in particular have been pushing the idea that climate change is the greatest national security threat that humanity faces. And they talk about how climate change, well, basically they blame anything that happens in the world, they liken it back to climate change. If if a nation is struggling uh, to supply its residents and its citizens with food, it's due to climate change. If houses are, are torn down by a hurricane, it's climate change. And like so much from the left, it seems to me that there's, a, there's an element of truth in what they say, because you can certainly make the case that uh, climate change, when there's not enough rain, when there's massive drought, it doesn't rain on the crops and crops don't grow. So how would you address that particular particular point? Remember, there's a difference between climate change and weather variability. First of all, climate does change and it ha- always has changed and humans can be an active role in that. In particular, when we look at land use change, in, uh, for example, that does change the condition. I mean, if you, you look at Dulles Airport, for example, the temperatures have been rising, but it's, and it's human induced, but it's because when Dulles was first created, it was in the middle of nowhere. And now, of course, you're probably aware, it's, it's surrounded by an urban heat island effect. So humans can and do change their environment. But at the same time, weather go- fluctuates. And so the idea is that we do have conditions where we have, let's say, more hurricanes one year, less hurricanes the next. We have maybe uh, an outbreak of tornadoes one year, and then the next year, not so much. Uh, We get lots of rain sometimes, and then not enough. That is natural variability. Uh, uh, So there are changes to the climate. There are uh, things that have happened and things that will happen as a result of human activity. But I think carbon dioxide becomes a much, much less player in things when you actually start to look at what are the facts associated with climate change versus natural variability. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of damage the left has been able to do in, into the minds of young people who look at storms that take place around the world and they immediately jump to alarmism about climate change and, and humans caused this when not so very long ago. It was just all chalked up to weather, weather patterns and so forth. So how do you reverse that change in mindset, that change in logic? Well, see, that's part of the problem is that we, you know, children are taught through an inconvenient truth and through other um, uh, things that, that they get in school that essentially climate changes only because of human activity and it's all us. And if we just stop it, these things won't happen. And, you know, if, if we've got a year, for example, with a lot of snow, that's climate change. If we've got a year with no snow. Well, that's also human-induced climate change. And so part of the problem is it's the narrative to keep you scared to death so you'll do what we want. And the problem is if you start to look at what the solution is to climate change as they propose it, the problem becomes what they really want is you to use less energy and to have fewer people. And both of those lead people back to poverty, uh, lead people to you know death and destruction, um, euthanasia, abortion, all that sort of stuff comes back because they want a smaller population that's living sort of in a very subsistence type of situation. And that's, that's not good for anybody. So in your book, in your research, uh, give the top two or three lies that are being told about climate change that are just so deceptive that, that they're eyebrow raising. Well, one of them is you're always told that, you know, the things are getting worse. Uh, you know, you see headline reports of hurricanes um, are becoming more intense, more frequent, for example. Landfalls are more likely to occur with more devastation. When you start to look at the, the statistics associated with weather-related disasters from a financial level, when you start to look at the number of people dying, when you start to look at the number of hurricanes that actually occur, you see a lot of variability, but you see no long-term trend. So what you're often told by the mainstream media is completely at opposite with what is actually seen in the, re the network. So the problem we always, I always have is that I show these kinds of things and then the next thing you know, here's an article that says, we've only got eight years to fix this. And we've been hearing this eight years, 12 years, four years, whatever it is, since the, the first Earth Day in 1970. I mean, we were told there was gonna be a massive die off by 1989 where there'd be about 65 million people in the United States dead because of climate change. Well, that didn't happen, that still hasn't happened. But of course, it's going to happen, it's just in the future. <laughs> and, and I sort of liken that to Y2K. You know, if you remember yes. the Y2K bug problem, that went away. And the reason it went away is it had a drop dead deadline. If it doesn't happen by the year 2000, January 1st, then you can't keep pushing it in the future. The problem with climate change is they can always push it in the future. And it's the agenda that they're trying to set, I think, particularly because when you look at um, AOC's uh, chief of staff, when you look at some people uh, that are running climate change in the UN, they make no bones about it that climate change policy is not about climate change. It's about wealth redistribution. Exactly. And, you know, uh, you said eight years. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez last year was running around like her head cut off, a chicken with its head cut off, crying about 12 years. And, and, and like you rightly point out, that 12-year deadline never changes. It's always the same. And if you question it, then they throw someone up on the world stage like Greta Thunberg, uh, who, whom I'm curious to get your response. What, what do you think of Greta Thunberg? Um... <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned because, uh, you know, she's being used, I think, by the left. Uh, I, I don't know whether to call her a pawn. Um, certainly by now she's old enough to know what's going on, and she plays the part well. Um, but, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's essentially someone that children or kids can, can relate to. Here's one of my own, essentially somebody about my own age, and they are being an activist. Why can't I be an activist, too? So it plays a, a strong role in that, but I'm afraid, you know, like, like many others, she's, I um, almost want to say useful idiot. I won't call her an idiot, but that's the sort of category that people use. Do you think Americans in particular are on to the deceptions of climate change and it's simply being fueled forward 
by media hype and 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 their partners in in the left leaning uh, political world, or do you think Americans really are afraid of the world coming to an end in eight years or twelve years or whenever? I, I think everything has become polarized, and I think this the answer to your question is that it's polarized too. I think there are those that are certainly very concerned that they've, they've listened to the hype, they've been told that we've got to do something uh, and got to do it now. Uh, on the other hand, I do think there's a wide variety of people uh, that are starting to wake up and realize that they've been had, that this constant, uh, you know, that the, the, the monster is just around the corner, trust me, uh, you got four years, you got eight years to fix it. Um, is, you know, at some point it grows old. It's the boy that cried wolf too many times. Um, and I, I don't think there's a wolf coming, And but I think the idea is you keep drumming this, this up, you'll get people into action, and you've got to look at what really is the action they want you to do. And as I said, a number of people have come out and said, this isn't about climate change at all. It's about wealth redistribution. It's about changing uh, global governance. Uh, so there's a larger agenda to be set. So we have time just to, just to wrap up with this last question. Give a cooler head approach to how sane Americans should approach climate change or environmentalism and do their parts as good stewards, good biblical stewards of our nation uh, without being sucked into the insanity that has really become the left on environmentalism. Well, and I think particularly you just need to look and see for your own eyes what's happening. I mean, people, when you see pollution, you know what it is. And so there are clear things where people, where pollution is being created. Uh, we have cleaned up the environment considerably uh, since the first Earth Day when we had the Cuyahoga River on fire. We had Love Canal. We, we know better now. But part of that is because we have a better economic base. I mean, the problem is that when people are struggling for food, clothing, shelter, and security, they'll move heaven and earth to get that, and the environment sort of goes by the boards. Once you've got those four settled, and part of that is having time to also work on the environment, which is an energy supply that is safe and, in particular, cheap, then you can start to clean your environment. And I think that's being good stewards of your environment, is taking care of... Uh, uh, making sure that the environment is clean um, from true pollution, but at the same time realizing that energy is the lifeblood, that people need energy. And as John Christie once said to uh, a Senate testimony, um, because he was a, a missionary in Kenya for a while, he said, you know, in these third world countries, life is brutal and life is short. And if you really care about these people, energy is the key and climate change just becomes a way of keep taking your eyes off of that important component. That's a good point. Yes, and we, and we certainly can't go back to caveman days. The book is Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate. Co-author David Legates, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt and injecting some sanity into this very divisive debate. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here. Lies and fear, see how they work? See how clever the left is about using lies to advance fear and then ratcheting those fears to bring about regulatory controls and clamps on individual liberties? The coronavirus, climate change, they do it with everything. The left, honestly, is evil. And isn't that what evil uses, fear, and deceit. Thank you for listening. I want to remind you, if you like Bold and Blunt, check it out at edify.app backslash podcasts. Go to washingtontimes.com and subscribe to my three times a week newsletter there, as well as my twice weekly Bold and Blunt podcast. And pick up a copy of my newest book, Lockdown, The Socialist Plan to Take Away Your Freedom, and learn more, more, of how the left is planning to platform this coronavirus into climate change, climate change alarmism, and continue the use of fears and lies to steal individual freedoms and, most importantly, crumble America, the last wall of God-given liberties in the world. 
Thank you for listening. Tune in next time. And in the meanwhile, stay blunt, stay bold. <laughs>